Hi, everyone, and I'd like to welcome my guest today, my very good friend. I've known him for, goodness me, way over 20 years, uh, the wonderful Mushin Ertegrel, who's not only a top football coach, but a wonderful human being. And I'm hoping that today the rest of you will find out what a good guy he is as well. Um, for those of the, you that don't know, Mushin uh, is, a, is a UEFA Pro Licensed Coach. He's a Turkey, he's been a Turkish, uh, uh, worked for the Turkish national team. He's an advisor as in the tech, Turkish Technical Committee, and he's also a FIFA technical, uh, what, you, what would you call it, Mushin? Uh, technical study group and technical committee, yeah. And how many years have you been with the FIFA technical group? Oh, group? Uh, actually since 97. Uh, 97 okay so this whole this the the birth of this podcast was actually born by the south african soccer fans because i sent a tweet out i think two days ago and uh on my twitter account and i'll put that handle we'll have that handle on the on the screen and i said the biggest difference between the psl and the english premier league is the intensity of the game intensity is about tactics coaching fitness attitude and understanding the world cup highlighted this so why the low level of intensity in the PSL? What I was overwhelmed about was the response from the South African football fans, over 50,000 uh, uh, um, views on this. And the level of intelligence that I got mission from the fans, and you yourself obviously saw it, you came on and you contributed as well. The level, what, came, what became clear from the fans was number one, their passion for South African football, their love of South African football, and critically, their desire for this, to stop this, uh, um, sort of fall from grace of South African football. And they gave the reasons why the game has, uh, has dropped over the years and what they believe the solutions should be. And intensity of the game is, is, is a critical part of football. The level of intensity is not just about, as you know, about fitness and, and running. It, it encompasses everything. And, and I think that's where the area we've, we've, we've uh, dropped the most. But before I go into that, I want to just give you and, and our viewers out there a very clear example of the dropping of standards in South African football. If you look at the last World Cup we qualified for in 2002, if you go through that squad, two goal, there were three goalkeepers. Two of the goalkeepers, Hans Fonk played Dutch top league for, for his entire career. Andre Aronsen played for Fulham when they were a top side going into the English Premier League. They were in the first division. If you look at the right back, you know him well. He didn't play overseas, Cyril Nzama, but I believe, Mission, he could have played overseas. He was tough, he was strong, he could tackle he could go forward. He was probably a little bit too old by the time that World Cup came, but he, he was a quality player. Left back, we had Bradley Connell played all his life in the Bundesliga. We had his reserve understudy was Jacob Jacob, Lech, uh, um, uh, Jacob Lech, I forget his surname right now, who played left back in Russia for many many seasons. The two centre backs, Lucas Rudebi, one of the one of one of the best centre backs ever in the Premier League. Uh, Aaron McQuenna played hundreds of games in the, in the Premier League as, as, his, as his partner. The reserve centre-backs were Pierre Issa, who played for Marseille in the, in the top league. Uh, there was also um, Tabang Molefe, who played for a couple of seasons in, in France as well as a reserve. If you look at the midfield mission, left-hand side Buckley, all his time in, in Bundesliga. Central, central of the midfield, Quinton Fortune, Man United. Uh, uh, um, wide on the right, Stephen Pinnock, Bundesliga, Premier League. Um, uh, who else played in there? Other, other central midfielder. Yeah, and he played for Ajax. Other central midfielder was uh, Sabeo, who played donkey's years in Russia. Up front, a choice of Benny McCarthy, mm -hmm. one of the world's mm -hmm. strikers at the time. Mumveti played in Italy for a long career. George Kumitarakis, his entire career in the Swiss top league. And Zuma, Bundesliga, uh, FC Copenhagen. So you're talking about a team that was full. By the way, in reserves there, the kind of reserves were like, Jabu Pule, who also played overseas, but Jabu was a potentially a, world, a top, top, top player. So that from that team in 2002, which is 20 years ago, just over 20 years ago, I ask you, you can't, there's not number one on a plane, Bafana playing in a decent league right now. And I tell you what, Mushin, you know South African football, I defy you to try and name a Bafana 11. You couldn't name a Bafana 11 right now. Most people can't. So that to me defines, sadly, the collapse of South African football. And you, somebody who loves South African football, I love South African football, the fans love South African football. We've got to, we've got to start being honest with ourselves and, and say, what's gone wrong over these years? And there's nobody better than you, because you come from both worlds. You come from the South African world. You, 
I call you a South African. You've lived here a huge portion of your life. You've you worked here. You love our football. But you also have another foot at the highest level internationally in part of FIFA, been at the Euros with Turkey. So you, you're in both ponds. Most of us in South Africa sit in one pond and we can't give that double view. You're in the position to give our viewers right now a view from outside why they've been so successful. We can look at Morocco as well and why are we struggling and what are the solutions. We don't have to finish it in this podcast. We'll go on as long as we can and I can see two, three podcasts because I'm pretty certain after this readers will, will ask even further questions. So Mushin, just the first the big question. You, when you come and go and you come and go, have you seen the standard dropping continuously or has it been much worse in the last few years? Where, what have you seen? Before you look at solutions, what is your, your take from the time you've been here and, and you leave and come back and leave and come? What do you see happening or what has happened? Yeah, thank you, Peter, for the invitation. And um, um, it, is, it is football in South Africa has become, uh, um, I, I think, very naive uh, when you look to the international development in the last years of international development. So you had uh, one comparison, the, the Bafana Bafana team in uh, to the, to the World Cup, and um, even to the World Cup uh, earlier on, and Africa Cup uh, '95 from that as well, process '96, and then uh, coming to that part uh, to the World Cup in the, to, to yeah, 2016. Ninety percent of that team played overseas as well. Yes, so there's a, the, also the second word that you had to compare to is Morocco. Uh, the Moroccan 14 team, the 14 players of Morocco uh, have played uh, or are playing in top top sides in international football uh, in international leagues. And uh, there are major players, uh, let me say, major shareholders in the in the, in the team uh, where they're playing. So that means that uh, they need, just needed to combine the, the the qualities together and understand the tactical aspects. And uh, they played such a great tournament because of, uh, I will say, because of so many players are playing international high level of football intensity. What you just mentioned in the in the starting point. So, so I should uh, interrupt you. So it's clear. It's very clear. It doesn't take a genius to work this out. If your national team is not filled with players playing at the highest level overseas, you can't compete overseas, for number one. And number two, it means there's something wrong with what's happening locally. Because players aren't born overseas. So that means players aren't born overseas. A lot of Moroccan players are sure, born overseas. I mean, uh, for sure. You're, 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 you're not exporting players. You can also say that for Argentina. You can say that to to Brazil. Uh, the most players are playing from from Brazil, not playing in Brazil. The the most players. So then uh, we need to we need to look uh, the holistically a bit. Uh, we need to look into um, last fifty years. The World Cup is do dominated by six countries. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> when you look to the six countries, what are their what are their intensity of their uh, and 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 you come always into to the education platform immediately. So. Uh, I will make a U turn now and try to explain that, uh, from my view, the last World Cup now was one of the best World Cups from uh, from not only from the from the intensity. This is a very important factor. Uh, the World Cup had 150, 156 players, uh, which is for me a very important factor to mention that 156 players uh, between 97 and 2002 born. Um, who, who participated in this World Cup. So, young players. Uh, and when you look to the young players, uh, the final between Argentina and France, Argentina had eight players played under-17, under-20 World Cups. And uh, France had played 100% uh, of their players uh, played in the youth development part, international uh, way, at least under-17 or at least under-20. So that means... You mean they played, you mean they played in international tournaments, Mission? They played in international under-17 World Cups, under-20 World Cups. So the French players, the 14 players that part, uh, is been, been born between 97 and 2002, 100% of them played in this type of international games. So <clears throat> when you look to, them now, to the African teams, uh, it's only 29% of the players played in this type of World Cup, the young players, 97, 2000 born. It's, it is it is something that you you have no chance. Uh, it is lip service. It's an EBT. You've hit. That's why I love you being here. We could even stop right now, but we won't because you've just hit. So let's make this clear to South Africa. The point you're making straight away, the very first point you're making straight away, South Africa. Mushin has identified something that I don't think any of us have actually noticed. And thank you, Mushin. In order to be successful international country. In, world, in a World Cup, 
no matter whether you're South Africa or England or wherever, the, major, the proof in it is in the pudding that with France, 100% of their players had played in under 17, under 19, under 21 World Cups competitions. Their, their junior in the, World Cups. In what we had at the moment won Correct. a World Cup. Correct. But in Africa, the African teams, only 20% of the players who were competing only in the 20, World Cup. 20, 29%. Sorry? Only 29%. Yeah, only 29%. 29%. 29%. So under 30% played. That's just so one clear thing is we've got to get more junior. Our, our, our players have got to be, be performed. Our national team in South Africa, under, under 17 and under 19, which is ignored, by the way, completely by South Africa, completely. Uh, by, by SAFA. They don't even play any games. That team has got to qualify for World Cups, and those players have got to graduate to the national team. That's could you, could you, could you know, I have a, immediately one question to that. Could you at the moment from the under-17, under-19, under-21 uh, team at the moment, can you figure one player out that you could say, uh, imagine that this player could be a world star or a world top player playing in the five top leagues in the world? So that is very difficult to imagine. Impossible in South Africa. Good. You could have done it in the past. You, Stephen, we had the School of Excellence and you could have identified Stephen Pinar. Uh, it was very Absolutely. clear from a young age that he's been a top player. Benny, I saw Benny at 18, 19, he, he, um, I said, guaranteed top player um, today. You can't because you don't even see the under-17 play or the under-19s play or even the under-21s play. So, Mush, there, is, there, is a, there is a vital point. That's, that is critical. And I hope, Safa, you're listening. Uh, I know Bruce, the, the national team coach, Hugo, has been saying this for a long time. Um, South Africa public, pressure on Safa. The under, we want to see the under-17s, under-19s. Mush, I'm going to say you need to coach them, but that's another story. <laughs> Uh, Peter, this, this is very uh, Safa and PSL. They, they there seems to be not from from outside. That we see inside is maybe uh, it's a bit different. But um, Safa, the technical director and the Safa community needs to understand what club development is, and um, the club development is the one who's going to feed the international level of. Uh, of uh, so you don't need scouts in the, bring scouts in. So you need this. Uh, you, do, you you need to understand uh, the development part of the team. So you need to understand the teams in the in the PSL or in the one league low, lower. And that's where the where the, where the whole the whole uh, whole challenge comes into. And um, now what Chiefs does is that uh, I'm jumping, bring in so many young players in at one time, but they didn't have this under 17, under 20 international exposure, the highest level of intensity of development structure. So they bring in practically uh, primary school boys, four, five, six years of, of development to the university. <laughs> so this is what they're going to understand, what they're gonna, how they're going to deliver. And there's also a lot of psychological part of it. Not only uh, you're going to lose those players uh, under pressure, under, 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 under the level suddenly thrown in in that, in that deep end. And um, that, that is a very vital uh, issue that you need to develop the players. It's not a lip service. It is a really... Uh, you cannot get this minimum effort to maximum out. Uh, youth development is a different structure. I like that phrase, Mushin. Minimum, you can't expect minimum effort to get maximum out. I'd like to repeat that to South Africa. You cannot because that, that shines so bright to me in what I see is happening with our club teams, um, with the exception of a couple, maybe I think in particular Sundowns and other clubs may, may be doing it as well that I'm unaware of, is that it's minimum effort with the youth because they, it's really just there because they have to have it or they think they're having it. There's no, that's where there should be bigger effort in the youth than it is in the, in the first team. So let's just summarize. You gave us an excellent point about the, the under-17 World Cup players, under-19 playing in a, in, in a World Cup in the France-Africa example. The second point you make, which and I want to highlight that for the listeners as well, because at the end of this, we need to, we need to have almost like a document out of it, is that SAFA has to treat look at club football youth sections as part of their, their remit because those are the players. Those players are the ones that should be in the under-17, under-19, and under-21 national teams. They don't need scouts. They need to just go to those teams. And they should be working with, are you saying they should be working with the clubs to ensure that South Africa has under-17, under-19, under-21 players that are going to be able to play at the highest level in the national team and play in these top competitions and qualify. Of course, they need to understand. I want to ask you a question. So 
So that's not happening. I can tell you now that's not happening. That's something else yeah, itself is going to do. deal with, with the PSL. So that's what we've got to make happen. The, but if it's all very well, even if they do it, if the, I don't think the level of coaching at youth level in South Africa is experienced. I think it's, you used the word naive earlier. I think it's ex extremely naive. I think there's a lot of people who want to coach and have got the, got the desire and the commitment. But, you know, getting a license is, is just like getting a degree. It doesn't necessarily mean that you've got, you, can, you can practice. Uh, practice this, comes is, from this is very important, uh, Peter. We, we did discuss, uh, I did a presentation in Turkish football about it. Uh, but what, what is happening in Turkish football at the moment, you can see that they want to bring all these foreign ex-players in. Uh, that's great, it's, but it, this is worldwide uh, happening. Uh, this is great to bring informal ex players in, uh, but it doesn't mean that uh, you you are a great uh, player that you've been uh, be, been a great coach. So uh, you have to give. Uh, from from my opinion, that has to be division in in uh, professional football and youth football. You can't. Uh, I can also say a nice prize about it. Uh, you cannot bring a Nobel Prize holder. Uh, to bring uh, to the ex ex exam of the of the of the, uh, of the college. So how is going to the Nobel Prize holder, which is the highest level that he, he has become, explain the, the, the people who are just doing the exam? So you need to have some, some people in there who can teach the exam how to pass the exam and not bring in Nobel Prize people in there. So it is, it is all, all use, use section. When you do the license for, for your question, and this is for me where I'm very passionate about, you need to have the licenses. License doesn't bring you how to think. A uh, license uh, will uh, make you understand where to look to. Uh, yes. So when, when you sit in, a, in this, in this, I did, uh, the German Federation is one of the best in the world. So they have eight to 12 hours, 12 months, uh, where you only, only been in the Sport Science Institute. So I'm saying Sport Science Institute, the training's methodic is becoming science. So, uh, so when you see in the world football today, you have eight, 10, 12, 14 coaches running around. Uh, and, and, and players have become so valuable, and especially these young players in the development structure became. It is it is a, a multi billion dollar business at the moment in football, and uh, it become more and more players are unbelievable valuable. So every player is like a like a company by its own. So you have practically twenty five joint venture running around there, uh, companies running around there. So you need to manage that as a CEO, as a coach. So today's coach is not mere standing in the in the hand in the pocket and decide what to do. It is not anymore. So the, the world football has to come to a level uh, mixed with this science and especially with these young uh, players in the education platform. It is very important. Let's stay with the, you, um, with the uh, licenses. You can't have a D license running around in the, in the Premier League. I mean, come on, this is, this is not possible. So uh, the biggest problem is that uh, you need to, and it's not that you, uh, they show you how to, how to think. It is how they, where they're going to look into. How are you going to develop your team? How are you going to develop your individual? How are you going to develop your, your team um, tactical viewpoints? And uh, it, is, it is such a big spectrum. This is why wherever I go, I, I, went, I took Elsa with me, one of the best spot, uh, let me say, performance coaches worldwide. So if you have somebody like that sitting here in South Africa and has not been enough involved. Or what is me. not involved in my club right now. Crazy. Yeah, it is. It is. It's amazing. And uh, when you look, and we had in the Turkish national team, we had four performance coaches. Uh, we we needed to look into what is happening in our players who plays for Inter Milan, the one who plays for Leicester, the one who plays for Bayern Munich. So we need to bring those players. That everyone plays in the uh, in the week different type of football, different type of tactical organization formats. And uh, so then you need to look into that how you can combine. Uh, let me say. Those elements and make something something uh, out of it like uh, this year of, uh, Morocco did uh, so well. Everybody yeah. stood and understood to be in a certain aspect uh, and, and tactical shame scheme uh, how to how to how to perform. But we we jumping out uh, yeah. for the just a, mission. So just to, to, okay. Sorry, you carry on. I wanted to ask you a question. For you, uh, the, the question I want to say is that this, it is important, it is vital that SAFA needs to provide a bright spectrum of uh, possibility of people from all angles. Some, some just want to be uh, under, under 10, under 11, under 12, under 13. Every age is a uh, year is, is different to the, 
uh, to uh, the upbringing, the cultural background. What so, I say, so shouldn't, shouldn't, sorry to interrupt you, but shouldn't what SAFA should be doing then, from what I from what I hear from what you're saying, and first of all, what you're saying just highlights how far we are in South Africa from being able to stop the rot, because the PSL cannot improve overnight. You can't suddenly take a coach in, you can bring in the world's top coaches, you can bring Klopp in, you can bring Pep in, and Mushan Etigral in, and, what, and that's why I feel for a lot of the pre current uh, PSL coaches. And you know what? They will raise the, the team level 10%, 15%, you may win the league, but the reality is it won't transform it because the transformation has to come from you know, when the kids are youth, so that by the time they come into the first team, as you say, they're almost degreed players. they professors themselves. They understand what they've got to do. It's not they're learning professionalism for the first time. Whereas if you're a youth player in anywhere in Europe, you are actually a youth professional player. You are training to become a, a specialist, you know, sure. like a doctor. And our players are not being trained to be specialists. And that goes to the point of... of uh, um, of uh, um, our youth setups at clubs, I agree with you. When you initially spoke, I thought to myself, is he right? Because this should be the responsibility of each club. But actually, I was wrong. You're right. We need SAFA to come with a, with a unified approach to coaching youth football throughout the country in all the professional clubs and show that kind of uh, um, mandate or, or that formula to the clubs that this is what needs to happen at under 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 21, and so on and so forth. So this is, this is... Mm -hmm. so can, one last point, but it's all very well having that formula and, and the program, if you, but if you don't have the teachers to be able to implement that, and I think we've got lots of guys who know football and love football and are willing to put the time and commitment in, but there's no one there to teach them. I think yeah, that's the, no, problem. The, biggest, the biggest problem is uh, football is uh, developing uh, and uh, uh, the evolution of uh, now um, the spice, the science involved in, in the, this, this is a this is this become more and more a hard business a hard uh, uh, yes. money business and um, you need to understand that I just have uh, uh, something in front of me uh, t 2020 before the uh, COVID started, I was uh, with the Turkish national team. We did research, and this research uh, is on the CSI. CSI is a, um, it's an organization that looks into development in football worldwide. So they looked into the 80 top leagues in the world, the top sides of football uh, in the eight in South Africa, and looked to the under 21 players, uh, under age, under 21 years old. How many of them are playing in the highest league in the world, in the, in the leagues? South Africa's uh, over China rock bottom. <laughs> it says, you, do you know that? No. South Africa, South Africa is uh, you have only five five point six percent players are playing under twenty one uh, in the PSL regularly. So uh, when you when this is in a, I can say that I can mention twenty twenty in the CSI report and uh, report uh, three fifty, uh, it shows the eighty top leagues in the world and uh, South Africa is right on the bottom, just over China. So and we've got it is all the resources under the sun, and we've got talent here. Yeah, this is what we always say. This, this is a huge always discussion about talent, and we have, yeah, what is talent and how we how we can take this talent out. Uh, they need to be in competition. Players can can't grow on the stands. Players need to be on the field. Players needs to need to uh, like when you say you have your own child. You you will send your own child to the best schools in the world, uh, to the best schools in in your area that you have, and to the best teachers. So you will and and that's what what is happening, and that is not happening in South Africa. That's happened in international football. So uh, the youth development structures, the pool of uh, intelligent players has become, uh, it's, it, it is an ISO uh, 2015. I was one of the technical committee uh, uh, of 2015 in Turkey under 20 World Cup. Uh, I was the face on that time. So what happened there? I saw Pogba. I saw Pogba, he became from us, from the TSG. We did, uh, we uh, gave him the, the golden boot uh, because of the best player of this tournament. How old was so, he then? Uh, under 21, under 20, under 19 years old. 19. So, so all these type of players uh, internationally, that level to achieve that level, they need a proper youth development. So in his own club needs to be, and, and this is what Safa uh, has to do in, in, uh, in South African football. The clubs here become a certain type of money and they have all the sponsors. That's all, all good. 
But the biggest problem is that how much percentage gets goes, it's always decision by the own club. And that has to yeah. change. That has to be, that has a subvention from, from, from SAFA. On from certain type of sponsors, at least let me say from your gross, 10% of your gross you're giving to, to the youth development is controlled by, let me say, an outside organ. Uh, yes. That has to be discussed. That has to be, uh, be. There might be another solution. I'm not. Uh, I'm not now the, the scientist for that. But in the end, uh, we need to look into that. How can we develop? Now you have here mushrooms growing all over South Africa. Now everywhere is an academy. But yeah. you can't have an academy with academy. which one? I, I want to yeah. send my child there. So, what kind so of academy is? Academy is not an academy. Academy is not an academy because it's called an academy. So uh, yeah. it has to be at least a, a, a scientist in there. It has to be a, a proper um, licensed, psychologically, physically educated coaches who gives my, my children, and especially, let me say, in the pubertary area where the age of 11 to 13 is the most, most, most important uh, uh, ages of, of, of these young players. They need to give them the right uh, possibility. And I see that yesterday I was running uh, here a bit uh, uh, and then uh, I was walking. You, you know, you know, I walk every day. And so, some in the corner, I see uh, young players in the age between 10, 11, 12, 13 years running and doing physical stuff. And I really wanted to go to the coach and say, I man, use this wonderful time to work on the technique, to work on the abilities, but not why do you want to have a physical strength on, on, on people that is still on growing a period. So this yeah. has to change. This attitude has to change. And uh, there is a lot of, lot of uh, misjudgment in, in South African football. And you don't know where to start. You know, this is completely actually. I think, the, I, think the place to start, I think the place to start, and I want to, I want to say this very clearly to everybody who's listening to this, Please spread this gospel, what I'm going to say right now, guys. Mushin has just told us an official FIFA document is showing that South Africa is bottom in the entire world of producing players for overseas leagues. Lower than China. No disrespect to China. We need to hang our heads in shame. A little bit, a little bit over China. A little bit over China. Okay. Um, but still, we need to hang our heads in shame. We've gone from being, we claim to have the seventh I'm not, I didn't say it. <laughs> to claim to have the seven biggest league in the world. Um, I don't <laughs> think true, but, but, but that's a claim from the powers that be. We must yeah, no, good luck to them. Good luck to not them. Not claims that, are, that you can only back these claims up, maybe in income. In what you base? Know, in what base? Yeah, no, I know. But <laughs> we can't make claims that are untrue. The fact is, we're one of the lowest producers of players in the world. Yet, we've got a lot of money in this game, a lot of sponsorship. We've got the population size. We are athletic. We've got the, we've got the facilities. Not enough in the townships uh, or in the schools, but that, that can be changed. And we've got people who love football and want to play the game and have natural athletic ability. What we don't have is the, the common sense of how to put a program in place and make certain that that program has longevity and can create legacy. In other words, with players overseas, and then it continues and continues. In '96, we had that opportunity because we had so many players overseas, and we grew it even to 2002. Thereafter, when, funny enough, Mushin, this is the incredible thing. When money started pouring into the PSL, that's when everything went downhill. Yeah, I agree. Because it brought people into the game that were only interested in money as opposed to, and they're only focused on the icing of the cake. They don't need to know that the cake needs to be baked first um, and it's icing is the least important but so south africa the bottom line is first of all we we're in emergent the lights are out in football we we may still have a game going at the stadium but we're faking it the lights are out we're not producing players fifa's recognized the world recognizes it we the only way that can be changed is if we change it the changes of mission's just given us two and we're going to go into more examples two very clear examples one is a result that your players at a young age need to be playing in international tournaments so that they, they understand the competitive levels that are, that are there and that they even understand... In, even even in proper, proper leagues, uh, even in proper leagues and every weekend uh, in, a, in a demanding yeah. form of leagues. Uh, so uh, it, is, it is like you have in, uh, in, in Germany, in the Bundesliga, the under-19 Bundesliga. Yeah. Uh, so they're so playing. We need a national under seventeen league at least. 
Yes, yes. And, 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 and uh, this is very much important that you... Mission, that's not difficult to do because just from a marketing point of view, companies want to target under 17s and under 15s. That's because when the under 17s and under 15s demand something, their parents have to buy it for them. So the, 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 the money is there, the sponsorship's there. Um, and then, but uh, just to go on to your next point, there needs to be a proper plan from SAFA and the PSL clubs on, on, on how to make this happen. And I don't think we've got that ability there. And Mission, I'm going to say something out there. We need people like you. SAFA's got to come to people like you. And this is not an advert. This is not how this thing was meant to go, by the way. But we need to come to people like you. It doesn't have to be Mission Early Girl, but it's got to be people that, that come from overseas and not that we don't want our locals, but with the, that, that bring in what's best practice from the big countries overseas. What is best practice? And obviously, we put our own spin to it because we've got different styles and so on and so forth. But, but the fundamentals have got to be there. We need people to bring in the best practice and train our coaches and our ad administrators to maintain those best practices. And then, but we've got to continually look overseas to see what's happening at best practice because they're ahead of us and bring these people in continuously. So we need people like yourselves who've got a foot in both, in both worlds. Thanks for watching part one of Saying It Like It Is with me, Peter Dutoy. To hear what else Mushin Utrigal and I had to say, come back for part two. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and let us know what else you'd like to see in the comments column. Thanks a all, guys.